So, welcome everybody. Um, my name's Richard and I'm from Difference Northeast. Um, welcome to um, a couple more people come in. Welcome to this session called Unpacking Neurodiversity. Um, and a very happy Autistic Pride Day. Um, in a moment, I'm going to hand over to Kate Fox, who's going to be our host for this session. But I just wanted to say a few words about difference and um, what to expect today. So if you don't know um, difference, um, we are a, a user-led charity, which means we're run by disabled people for disabled people. And essentially what we want to achieve is greater equality for disabled people across the Northeast. And the way that we do that is by advocating for disabled people, by campaigning, by educating and training people. Um, so this session really fits well into that, um, that agenda. Um, if you are um, supportive of that, um, then we would ask that you um, have a look at our website and, and join us. Um, it doesn't take very long. Um, it just means that we can stay in touch more easily and, and, and let you know about <clears throat> our work. So, uh, at this session, we, we want you to feel relaxed and comfortable. Um, if you need a, a break at any point, please just take one. There's no need to ask. Um, if you would like any help at any point, if it's technical or you've got a question, then we've got um, Nick and Louise are here. They can keep an eye on the chat or can respond if you if you put your hand up. Um, we'll do our best to, to help you. Um, for now, we'll keep people's videos and microphones off, but later on when, when we get to the kind of Q and A bit, then we can we can ask you to put your, your video on if you have a question. Um, we are recording this session just so that we could share it with people who couldn't make this time today. Um, okay, time for me to shut up and I'm um, really looking forward to hearing from the panel and uh, what they've got to say about neurodiversity. And I'm looking forward to my picnic as well, which uh, I got from Greg's this morning. And uh, I'm usually a 12 o'clock person, so I'm gonna be really hungry. Um, but yeah, I'm going to hand over now to Kate. Thanks, Richard. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, I'm Kate Fox. Um, I suppose I used to introduce myself by saying I'm a stand up poet in a really confident way, as if that somehow defined me. Um, but nowadays, um, live performances are a bit of a thing of the past anyway. And self def definition can be really complicated. Um, but I'm still going to say it just because old habits die hard. Um, so it's really nice for me to be uh, connected to Difference Northeast in the last two or three months and for one of the first things I'm doing with them and um, being hosting a panel on neurodiversity because it feels like neurodiversity has become a bit of a buzzword. Suddenly people are talking about it um, and often I think they're referring to conditions like autism, ADHD, OCD, Tourette's, dyslexia, dyspraxia. Some people use it to refer to um, other invisible neural conditions, which might be um, a temporary brain injury, for example. Some people feel that depression and anxiety can come under neurodiversity. Um, basically, we're going to unpack a little bit what it means uh, to each of us on the panel. Um, and we'll introduce ourselves in a second. Um, and, and essentially, we're just going to spend 25 minutes, half an hour, 
exploring it a little bit. So hopefully by the end of that 25 minutes, half an hour, um, we'll all have a better idea of what do you, neurodiversity means to a few different people at least. Um, and then um, we were going to have Jenny Pascoe, the poet, perform. Um, but as handily, I am a poet too, and Jenny's indisposed. Uh, I am then going to do some funny poems and we can have our picnic. But I was always one of those people on the school bus who did actually start my picnic a little bit before we got to the destination. And I feel some of you might be those people too. Feel free. Feel free. Maybe it's a neurodiversity issue, perhaps. Now I've said that, I really want my strawberry, but I'm going to hold off. Um, I'm going to um, say a little bit about what neurodiversity means to me, and then I'm going to ask each of our panellists. Um, so essentially, um, I was diagnosed as autistic in 2017 um, when I was 42. It was a diagnosis that I sought um, because I felt it was likely I would be diagnosed. Um, but a few years before that, when I came into contact with other autistic people and, and recognised them in me and me in them, um, I believed um, what some psychologists said at the time, which was, well, you can't get a diagnosis unless you're suffering. And I was like, am I suffering? I don't think I'm suffering. I have cups of tea. I, I get to walk on the beach. I'm happy in my job. I'm not suffering enough. Um, now, actually, I don't believe that at all. I think having a diagnosis can be it can be helpful. Um, Self-knowledge. Self-knowledge is power, I think. And maybe neurodiversity um, and ideas around that um, represent that too. I'm just going to say a little bit about neurodiversity um, before I move on to introducing the panel. So it was originated as a term in 1998 um, in the work of the Australian sociologist Judy Singer. And she didn't really define the term at the time. She just used it to refer to conditions like autism, ADHD, and the kind of a civil rights movement, really, that was beginning to grow up um, around those conditions when people were beginning to speak out and say, hang on, uh, often people have spoken for autistic people. We would like to speak for ourselves. Um, she based it on the concept of biodiversity, the idea that nature is all the richer for having a great variety of species that cross pollinate um, and are resilient and resistant because there is such diversity. Um, and then there's a, a bloke called Nick Walker, who more recently has talked about the neurodiversity paradigm. It's quite controversial, but I'm going to read it because for me, it is what neurodiversity means because I see it as quite an active thing it's not just going the world is neurodiverse um it's a bit more like yes it is and we'd flip in better accept that in a positive way so he said number one neurodiversity is a natural and valuable form of human diversity number two the idea that there's one normal or healthy type of brain or mind or one right style of neurocognitive functioning is a culturally constructed fiction no more valid than the idea that there's one normal or right ethnicity, gender or culture. And finally, number three, he said, the social dynamics that manifest in regard to neurodiversity are similar to the social dynamics that manifest in regard to other forms of human diversity, e.g. E diversity of ethnicity, gender or culture. These dynamics include the dynamics of social power inequalities. So essentially, he was saying it's, it's a bit about power um, and you're not lesser if you are neurodivergent. Um, so let me first of all introduce Becky. Hello, Becky, who oh, is not on my screen. That's exciting. Oh, yes, you are, Becky. So could you tell us a little bit about you and what does neurodiversity mean for you? Thank you, Kate. Hi, everyone. My name is Becky and my neurodiversity package, as I like to think of it, is I'm autistic. I've got ADHD and OCD or CDO, as my brain likes to tell me. Um, I was diagnosed in 2015 as autistic, and that was after my little girl was going through her autism assessment. And it was, to me at the time, it was, I got to this point in my life where I felt like I had a, a billion keys and one lock, and I was trying 
every single key throughout my childhood and and then the day that I got diagnosed I just felt like I'd found the right key and unlocked this padlock and yeah I <laughs> went from there and um, so to me it, it's like my brain works differently sometimes I need different things and um, you can't see my neurodiversity if you're just looking at me I think and um, it's really challenging at times the way that I see, hear and feel the world is unique. The way that my brain is connected can sometimes lead me to become overwhelmed and confused. I need to be honest and open to other people about what I need. And letting myself know that it's okay to be different. So a lot of trying to advocate and change things that are wrong or don't work for my brain. And it's taken a very long time, but I now love my differences and my quirks. And my neurodiversity makes me who I am and makes me strong. And I think it gives me different and unique skills and an awesome weirdness that I now value and embrace. I think life's too short to be spending time trying to squeeze into boxes and feel unhappy. So I just try to do what makes me happy and encourage others to do the same. Thank you. Wow. What a beautiful statement, Becky. Thank you so much. Life is indeed too short to be squeezing into little boxes. Thank you. Some beautiful descriptions. And to me, what a great embodiment of what the neurodiversity movement and paradigm is about. Thank you. Um, next, we've got Claire, Claire Hussey. And excitingly, she has got a presentation for us, which may involve screen sharing and things going wrong. Ex enjoy the jeopardy, everyone. Hiya, Claire. Oh, oh we're going to go down the screen share. We can try. I'm more than happy to try. So first of all, I'm going to say, wow, both of you, uh, you what you've said is amazing. Um, and Becky, that was so eloquent and beautiful. Um, so I'm, I, I have dyslexia. I didn't find out until, like the others, uh, 2018, I was diagnosed at 44. And that was 12 years after I got my PhD. So for me, it was a complete surprise. Um, and it, it came about because I work as a civil servant, which will become apparent if I manage to share my, my screen. Um, and work started becoming really overwhelming for me. Um, I'd worked for myself for 10 years, managed my own time. I ended up in a job where everything was very full on and intense. And I just, anyway, I kind of came to a grinding halt for want of a better phrase. So three years in, I'm still feeling it's pretty new, um, but my diagnosis helped make sense of so many things that had happened to me in my previous life. Um, I, um, I struggle in some areas with my memory, et cetera. Um, but one of the things I've got this amazing ability to kind of make conceptual and personal connections. And, uh, you know, I, I do feel that as part of my dyslexia, I probably do have a, a, an increased level of emotive, emotional connection with people. Um, and because I am I'm a, the type of person that loves to share, I fully embraced being neurodiverse. And yes, I'm part of the work it's, again like Kate I'm quite new to Difference Northeast but I also am linked into some um, quite active cross-government networks so I'm working with people across multiple government departments that are doing some amazing things with our neurodiversity that will hopefully change the workplace um, in government which will then filter down across um, across Thanks. So shall I try with the screen sharing thing? I, I don't know if it's going to work. Um, it says Chrome unknown. Hold and shift. I want to try this. And if, I, if it doesn't work, I've decided I will be able. Oh, it says open systems preferences. I don't think it's going to work. So with that in mind, rather than me get myself into a tiz, I'm going to give you some stats. So these are stats that I, I use when I give presentations. So if we kind of think about our population in the UK right now, we have about 67 million people. According to the statistics, about 10 million people in the UK have some form of neurodiversity. And when, we, when I think of that in relation to where I work within government, there's, um, and that to be that also links in organizations such as the NHS, 
and, and schools, um, they're all sort of public sector. That's 800,000 people are, who are affected. Um, the next slide that I like to use, and I wish I, you could see it, it's so cool. It's um, basically a representation of 100 people. Um, and the, the figures are like, about like the little logo when you go into the toilet, there's the men and the women. And it's got 100 in a box. And 15 of those have been identified because it's, it's estimated that about 15% of the, the UK's population is affected in some sort of way um, by new, uh, neurodiversity. Um, and then one of the other things that, um, because I work across, not just with dyslexia, which is obviously my, my kind of main focus, I really love the kind of diversity, of what, like what Kate was explaining before, all of the different conditions. And Becky's ex explained it in her situation very well, because she's, it's a co-occurrence of the different neurodiverse conditions. Um, and the stat that I have in front of me, um, if you have dyslexia, you're 50% more likely to have dyspraxia too. And the, this, that's just one example, and I wish I had more to share, but it's, it's the fact that if you have one, you're incredibly likely to have something else. So, and that, I probably didn't use appropriate words there, but that, that was it. So I'm very sorry that my images didn't get to show, um, but I'm now gonna pass back to Kate and then she can take you on to the next bit. Thanks so much, Claire. And actually, I think what you brilliantly told us there is how very common, actually, neurodiversity is, how very much it, it kind of in some way touches probably everyone in the country, ultimately, but how great that there are the figures there to, to convince government departments and beyond that this stuff is not niche it's not little it's kind of it's vital actually um so I, thanks actually, so much. I actually suspect and as do my colleagues that it's actually higher but because um the british dyslexia association and and they kind of oversee a lot of the statistics across the neurodiverse conditions because it's linked to all of them i suspect it's higher um, and we were trying to, well, I'm trying on a voluntary basis, I'm trying to work up a way that will give us, get us a much more robust understanding of the scale of the, um, so I think it's higher. Yeah, 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 no, I, 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 I would agree, certainly in my experience that autism is massively underdiagnosed, so it's exciting to think that, that this awareness is spreading. I was really struck by your use of the word overwhelm, because I think Becky had talked about overwhelm as well and being overwhelmed, and for me that is one of the key manifestations of, of my neurodivergence, I think often being overwhelmed in situations other people might not find overwhelming. Um, well, it seems we're, we're all doing very well so far. Our last uh, panellist to talk about what neurodivergence means to them and um, let's welcome the token male of our panel um Matthew Moon hiya Matthew hi everybody um so yeah my name is Matthew um I'm an autistic person myself but uh, I was diagnosed um at a very young age actually um so I was a pr pr not even in I think I was in nursery when I got diagnosed or might have been even earlier than that but yeah it was a very young age so it wasn't like a, a later diagnosis or anything like that um, but I think for me, sort of the understanding came with sort of growing up and figuring out what, um, what, it, what, what sort of my autism meant to me and, um, how it, it sort of the experiences I had changed me because I had support growing up, um, in like in lots of different ways, like in school and things like that. And off my parents, sorry, noise outside, um, Neurodiversity is kind of a very new word to me. Um, I'd always like been grown up with um, like knowing what autism was and then um, what like you know that I was autistic and I also have the um I've been diagnosed as Asperger's syndrome, so that was mine. Um, but I always like knew about other kids in my schools, like they had things like dyspraxia and uh, some some kids had ADHD and stuff like that. Um, and neurodiversity was kind of. I learned about that word when I'd started working in um, an advocacy group. So that's that's sort of my diagnosis isn't new to me, but uh, that sort of word is. Um, but I've always just known it as like the way I look at it, the word to me kind of means just like the way different people experience the world around them. 
is kind of like that's how I break that word down and like you know all the various different ways people can have different those different experiences and uh, you know um, how it changes their experiences too for like both the positive and the negative so it's very much like sort of just experience as a whole you know it can be good and bad um, and it's got its upsides and downsides so like um, yeah I think it's just the diversity part's very true it's you know it's just like a huge collection of everyone's different experiences and um, how they're all uh, unique so yeah thanks Matthew that's that's brilliant do you know honestly I think the four of us with what we've said there we've actually kind of answered the question of what is neurodiversity in divergent ways we kind of done that tick that off so that's good because we've only got about 10 minutes left on this panel and what I'd like us to do so we're going to answer kind of quite briefly and snappily I think but we're just going to um answer two or three questions about kind of examples of neurodiversity acceptance and maybe what the challenges are to it and what we hope for the future then we're going to throw over to you the audience um for 10 minutes or so of questions and answers um, as well as you could ask us on the video you could ask us via chat um you can email difference i think we've we've kind of facilitated various ways in a neurodiversity friendly manner and um, just to add i suppose um we are a in some ways, we're a fairly representative panel. I'm also aware we're not very ethnic, like ethnically diverse, of course. Um, we don't have anyone non-verbal represented here, and actually, non-verbal autistic people, for example, um, are often great communicators. Um, we don't have any. Uh, oh, I'm just so we're yes we, but. You know, so we're quite diverse, but neurodiversity is even more diverse. And that's exciting too. But our first or next question to each of our panel, I'll start with you again, Becky. Have you experienced any examples of positive acceptance of neurodiversity, either in companies you've worked with or in, in the world around you or in your own life? Yeah, I feel like in my whole life, I've had more negative experiences, but more recently, um, I think um, my employers, Inclusion North, have been a real positive example for this question. Um, yeah, <laughs> they just, they're really, um, I don't know, it's just the culture of the organisation. It's very, I've lost my words, sorry. <laughs> Oh, that's all right. No, can you? So, I, 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 a culture of an organisation could be so important, can't it? Because actually, <laughs> even just talking about neurodiversity or offering people different ways of doing things yeah. can it, that in itself doesn't happen in many places. Are there examples where they've maybe given you an option of, of um, accessing something or doing work in a in a in a way that suits you? Yeah. Um, so I can get more time if I need it and um, I feel like they do meet all of my access requirements um, and yeah just they're just really supportive and, and clear about things and they're happy to to clarify things later or for me to communicate in different ways to what suits me how I'm feeling at the time and um, just really supportive yeah clarity can be so important I think for for neurodivergent people to, ha to have things said to us and, and and asked to us directly and I'm aware as a neurodivergent person I am myself often not very clear because my brain itself can go off in 12 billion directions but ironically I really love clarity in others um Claire some positive examples for you in your massive workspace and organization well, I'm gonna I'm gonna really blow your minds now because yesterday I was on um, this, within the, the the civil service that we have something that's basically like a conference for people to go and find out what's going on in other departments and it's called civil service live and it happens every year. Usually you go to a place and you you see presentations, but they've done it all online, which is fantastic because you get to see amazing people. So yesterday I was in a session and one of the ladies on the panel. Um, heads up so is in charge of um the covid task force for the cabinet office so she's this super important lady she was only recently diagnosed with autism and she was very openly talking about the fact that 
the way that she approaches things, her frankness, her literal understanding of things, you know, these are global situations that, you know, that, that have been impacting us all, you know, um, she, yes, yeah, she takes things very literally, and it's funny, Kate, you just mentioned that about reconfirming meaning, she says that is vital to the role that she does, taking things what people say, she interprets it, but she just needs to clarify the thing that's being asked of her. But she says her autism has been amazing when dealing with crisis situations. So I don't know, I just thought I'd share the fact that, you know, there's people very high up in government that have neurodiverse conditions. And I think there's more, there's a, a permanent secretary of the Department of Health and Social Care. He's openly has dyslexia. Um, and, you know, these are people that are running big chunks of the country. And it's just fantastic to know that. Anyway, just yeah. No, that gives me heart and hope. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, Matthew, any examples for you of neurodiversity ex uh, acceptance in your life and world? Yeah, so me going through my life, it's been like very mixed bag of like um, up and down sort of experiences. Um, it's funny, mo mostly in school, I did have difficulties, but I noticed positives like with like people around me. So they used to do things like my schools were at the time, like starting to help out people with dyslexia, they like we were creating computer programs and things like that to help them like um, learn words in a different way. And we're changing like, um, like lesson plans and stuff like that. And we're helping like, try different ways to like sort of um, do like English lessons and like teach words and like stuff like that, and just learn different ways of doing that. Um, and that, that was really cool. I saw that they were trying to change the way they taught um, their lessons in um, my school when I was growing up, which was pretty good. Um, my actual, like my, most of my positive experiences have been recent in sort of my recent life, especially with my company You know, I work for an advocacy group and they're like spot on with like, um, pushing acceptance and like making adjustments and stuff like that. Um, I've, I've never felt like, um, uncomfortable not to speak my mind and also be able to, um, share with people, like when the kind of things that I need and their support that I need. And so sort of, they've always been, uh, really good at sort of trying trying to get that for me and also like create those like uh, places where I can get um just stay, just be able to cope better and um I've I had like really I've ne never had any problems with that either and I think through teaching um through my work that kind of stuff as well I've noticed people chat like thinking about new ideas as well about how we can sort of make those differences and sort of change and um, the way we, we sort of approach support um, so yeah, definitely more recently I've seen more positives and seen people either um, be very open to it or like learning how to like to be open to it. So yeah. That's re again, really heartening to hear. Thanks, Matthew. Um, and again, I wonder how the word and the concept of neurodiversity does seem to be helping that perhaps because people are going, oh yes, we need to be more neurodiversity friendly. That's the thing. Um, a, a quick mention for me, something I, that I find very positive as a performer, I love it when um, often before a gig or a show, the promoter or the venue will provide a quiet room because they kind of recognize that performers probably need quiet space to get their head together before a gig. But it so happens that a quiet room is one of the greatest accommodations that can be made for many neurodivergent people where you can go and get your head together and not be overwhelmed. And I am increasingly finding that find uh, that conferences were beginning to provide quiet rooms and are, um, often with low lighting and um, people not having their devices going off. And that made me think, yeah, we're beginning to recognise we can change our environments. So a final question for, for all of our panel before we go to the audience Q&A. Um, and it's, it's kind of looking ahead to the future, really. Um, what one or two things could you suggest that might improve future acceptance and understanding of neurodiversity? Now, that could be something maybe that audience members can do, that individuals can do, or that you, you think society might be able to do to help greater acceptance of neurodiversity. So back to you again first, Becky, any thoughts? Thank you. I think it would be really good if society could meet us halfway and try and adapt things to make them more accessible. Have, it could be by having different ways to communicate, um, just generally being more open to doing things differently so that we are not always, it sometimes feels like at a disadvantage. 
meet yeah, oh, gone here. Yeah. yeah, I've got an example. Um, um, I had an interview with the police um, last year because I was a victim of hate crime. And mm. it would have been useful for me to have, after I did my statement, to have time to process it rather than that be the final thing, maybe go back to it the next day, but that wasn't an option for me. And um, I think just having a second chance of, you know, if you've had a doctor's appointment, then can you email some questions later? But it's, it's not always an option. Absolutely, yeah. Extra time to process and extra time to, to clarify things. I bet that's a big one for many neurodivergent people. Thank you, Becky. Um, and as you say, meet us halfway. That should be the slogan of something, it feels like. What about you, Claire? One or two um, yeah, things that might improve things? I just kept this really simple. I think um, I feel I, I consider myself a bit of an ambassador because I feel I've got a good story to tell in terms of nothing's held me back in the past and I've got to this stage in my life. And I just think um, by sharing my experiences with other people, it's not... It's not um, you know, if you have a problem with your memory, um, it could be the sign of something else. I, it, you know, it, you just, it's accepting that everybody is different. And yet, by me being different, now I know that there's reasons I approach things in certain ways. So by me sharing my story when I can, I, I just think it's, it's the right thing for me to do. Absolutely. Thanks, Claire. And, and thanks to to, to all our panel actually speaking out can still be quite scary I think because there is still this lack of understanding and acceptance sometimes but it can also be very empowering and I'm certainly feeling that what about you Matthew one or two things that could improve neurodiversity acceptance I think so of <clears throat> my number one would be sort of understanding that um not everyone falls and like not tarring everybody under the same brush you know every not everyone falls under like one specific um explanation of like a, a disability that's attached to them um so like you know even if like someone has like you know someone says oh i'm an autistic person that doesn't just mean that oh that like everyone like assumes what is like the sort of what people think is the general knowledge of what that is um so i think yeah sort of teaching that you know it's a very individual experience that everyone has even if they you know have been diagnosed with something or anything like that you know a life experience is what um, you know is what that person is not just the diagnosis that they've got um and also um i think also changing the structure with how like we approach like when when people want to offer support to people um, who might be struggling or who or just you know even interacting with certain people is like changing sort of the idea behind how you're supposed to do that you know like some people think that oh, I have to approach or like help this person a certain way because like that's like that's what I've been told by like how I've been trained or like the knowledge I've got of like that sort of um, you know whatever the, the person is like living with is is like to sort of challenge that and like sort of change the way we approach those things is like not not just seeing that person as like oh they have this diagnosis but also like how this person's like just getting you know just knowing that person as a person uh and th that comes first uh, before the diagnosis and you know if that factors in their life then yeah it's just i think it's learning that person as themselves rather than just their diagnosis i think is what some people need to I think that's a big thing of acceptance that needs to come with people when they hear that uh, about a person if they've got a diagnosis of something. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Matthew. So well put. Um, yeah, it's about not tarring everyone with the same brush and it's it's accepting the diversity of neurodiversity. It's not one size fits all for solutions. Thank you. That, that comes actually into the qu first question that I've seen in chat. And I think you've kind of answered that. Andy said, speakers have used the word unique a number of times. Do you think as a society, we generalize what autism means? Um, and I would say, yes. And I think Matthew's just really eloquently said, a reason that it's not good to do that is um, because there are so many different ways of supporting the individuals with a neurodivergent condition. There's a saying in autism world, um, you've met one person with autism, 
you've met one person with autism. Um, My boyfriend is autistic and we're exactly the opposite in many ways in terms of what we need and require. Um, So, yeah, thank you. I'm going to go on to other audience questions now with a huge thanks to our amazing panel who are going to keep coming back in perhaps to pop up for some of these questions. Um, But um, so Nikki from Scotswood Garden um, said that um, Scotswood Garden offer Adult volunteering in youth groups for five to 18 year olds, many of our members are neurodiverse. What would you say the practical things we can do or change day to day to make our services more welcoming and inclusive? And then as Becky was talking in the last answer, she said, ah, you're already answering my question. Thank you. And I think perhaps when we were talking about some of those accommodations we've all experienced, but individualized ones, um, then that can be really useful. And um, Tracy, thank you for saying in chat that um, you're so grateful for this sharing Zoom and all your our, our words. Overwhelm and clarity, particularly. Quiet time, difference and individuality. Your words are like pointers and a balm to me. Thank you. So thanks, Tracy. And that does seem to keep coming up as a theme. We're, we're talking about overwhelm and we're saying, Let's let's overwhelm people. I think everyone would like that in this post lockdown time. Will, I can see you've popped up with a hand. That's very exciting. You've got a hand thing. Um, go on. What's your question, Will? Yeah, I, I mean, I met you and uh, Colin last year as part of the um, autism in lockdown uh, uh, thing. I was the one that was very specific, which I didn't want my face to be in the, my photo. Um, it was, I, I was absolutely amazed at how it turned out. So thanks for including me in that. Um, I've just sent an email over to Richard. Um, uh, since we last talked, I've set up a small little CIC, which has got board of directors of neurodiverse people uh, around the country. And the aim is to try and engage with people to increase um, employment or understanding of the barriers that employers are putting upon people. Um, uh, for example, my partner's uh, deaf, um, but when people look at uh, uh, one of the comments she's had is, well, y- you don't look deaf or you're too young to be deaf. And uh, I mean, I get that a lot. You don't look that autistic or it's all in your head. And the, my response is, yeah, that's that's the issue here. It is all in my head. It's neuro. Um, but uh, the research that we're uh, undertaken with uh, uh, with Northumbria University's business department is what are the barriers into employment and how can employers change uh, change that to make it more accepting and before like I'll, I'll let anybody really answer that um, one of the things that my partner's stated who's got her master's uh, one of the reasons that she doesn't do it is uh, mention that her what her disability is is she thinks that people are just going to go oh, that's somebody who's disabled. We're going to have to spend lots of money. Let's go for somebody else instead. But we'll put it down to the fact that she didn't fill out the questionnaire correctly. Um, so what can reduce the barriers into employment? Thanks for that question, Will. Nice to see you again. I mainly recognise your hand from that photo. And oh, that I was like, love that picture. I, um, I, I did try to share it about at the beginning, but I was just getting a bit overwhelmed uh, myself at the beginning um, of uh, the first lockdown. But yeah. Well, bring it back. You've also got a whole new beard. But yeah, actually, that question about barriers was a question that was going to be in our panel. And we kind of skipped ahead to the audience questions. Uh, and I'm really glad that you've asked it because it's really important. So perhaps if each of us could could say what we think are the biggest barriers to employment. I mean, I'm going to speak out straight away and just say autism is still so stigmatized and stereotyped for me as a poet. People think that autistic people can't do metaphors and not warm and not empathic that's a huge barrier and puts me off coming out basically. Becky, what, what, would you, what do you find are the barriers? Um, I think there's a lot of barriers in there only sometimes being one way to do something. And it, when you want to do it a different way, it's like, no, this is the way you have to do it, which I'm finding I'm having to challenge that quite a lot recently. Um, um, I think a good example this isn't about me but um i've spoken to some people um from down south and they they struggled to work in their work environment but it's something that they could have done at home and they tried for a very long time to be allowed to work from home and then they said when COVID happened last year when everyone had to work from home it was it was easy to do but it because it was the majority needed it so 
they're questioning, well, why, why how couldn't I do it back then? It's so it's interesting where changes can be made if people really think about it. Absolutely. Thank you. Yes, it, it feels like this could be an absolutely key moment for accessibility if people see that chance, doesn't it? Claire, what barriers do you find particularly? I'm going to go back to my notes. Um, so, but I, yeah, I, I, because I speak to lots of different people all of the time, I find that a lot of people that I work with in government, they feel that they've got so much to give but they don't really know where to fit themselves that sounds a bit weird but you know they might be in a role that they might be struggling in and they're trying to get to another place but the recruitment process is quite difficult um and i had actually written that down as another point um there are a lot of inclusive employers that have um you know they almost follow the rules of the equality act to a t and they need to have a diverse workforce in order to kind of meet the key, their own performance indicators so if you are looking if people are looking for work then maybe look at that you know their kind of their state their public statements as a place to sort of target and uh, interestingly following on from um becky's comment that, that and i'm going to go off a bit off piece here because it also relates to what um, will was saying was it your partner or your wife i can't remember partner. Honor. So um, I also kind of link with the deaf community and one of the things that people with and because we're all using um, versions of digital communication, people with hearing impairments are, be, are felt really empowered whilst being off, um, working at home, sorry, they're not off, but, uh, with the um, having the words along the bottom. You know, they can, they're more able to actively participate in meetings. And also the thing about being able to put your hand up. Some people with autism or various um, forms of dyslexia, they, they, um, they feel that like they clump up or they, you know, they, they want to say something. And if they don't say it at that time, then it's forgotten. And for me, that's always the case. I'm surrounded, always surrounded in notes in case I forget to say the thing. But I know I've gone off on a bit of a, a, a wacky one there, but I think employers on the whole are working towards being more inclusive. Um, yeah, I've lost my track now. Sorry. No, no, thank you. That's a great place to, to end there. That's a, a great note of hope, actually, isn't it? Maybe look for the employers that are looking to meet those inclusivity targets um, and they may not have perfect knowledge of how to do that, but perhaps some of us pioneers can help them um although it does mean work for more work for us it feels like that's why gonna... i've uh, sorry that's why i've actually tasked northumbria uni business department to research for me so i can get them to get the research uh, uh i've already emailed richard uh, to just say that i'm you know willing to work uh, with different northeast and everything uh to to share information across but yeah Great. Thank you, Will. And thanks for the question. Um, I'm just going to give us all a little quick time check. Um, luckily, because I'm doing the performance, I feel OK about shortening my performance where I would have felt quite mean to cut Jenny off. I'm going to suggest we do still move towards ending the event on time as far as possible, maybe going a couple of minutes past one. Um, so I'm wanting to move us towards wrapping up um, the audience questions. What I'm observing is um, there's an appetite for more, I feel like, um, more, more thought sharing and more questions around neurodiversity, particularly around employment, perhaps, is what I'm picking up. Um, and it would be great to, um, I think, um, perhaps we'll have a chat in Difference Northeast about how we can facilitate that just to look at the chat, the audience chat. Um, so Pam Robinson was saying we've recently launched a new volunteer passport scheme, vol volunteer passport scheme in Newcastle. Does anyone have any tips on how we can ensure inclusive volunteer recruitment? Whole topic in itself and I would love um, to address that but we haven't got time now and then Scott M recently diagnosed autistic wondering if the panel could suggest how to begin to look at it in a positive way and also asking about peer support in North Tyneside and um, Scott it would be great if you could get in touch with Difference Northeast and we can um, pass on some top tips uh, about um, groups around and about but there's certainly a lack of peer support but there is some um, 
panel to take us to the end of this question section. I wondered if we could address a, a part of Scott's question. Um, how can we see our neurodiversity? Somehow do this in a sentence, neurodivergent panel. Yeah, sum up all your complex thoughts into a sentence spontaneously now. How is your neurodiversity a, a positive thing? You've been telling us actually brilliantly for the last 50 minutes. I'll kick us off. I will say, how can you see it as a positive thing? The way I have found helpful is by being part of other groups of neurodivergent people and seeing how they are finding it to be positive. I find the hashtag actually autistic and the hashtag um, ADHD squad on Twitter useful for people sharing tips and experiences. And I'm a couple, a member of a couple of Facebook groups for autistic and ADHD adults. And I just see such positivity every day, as well as challenges, which we share in helping to overcome. Becky, any thoughts? I agree with you, Kate, about the actually autistic hashtag on Twitter. I find that's really helpful to engage with others and see how they describe things and how they deal with things. Um, I also, to help me, because I used to be really, really down about it at first, and I got a diary and every time something that I thought was negative happened or something that I thought about my autism, I used to write it down. And then for each thing, try and find a positive in it, even if it's just, yeah, that's not the same way as that person, but this is actually a really good way and then maybe more people could do it this way. Just trying to pick out the uniqueness and what just because it's different, it doesn't necessarily mean it's negative or wrong. Just learning, learning how to do it. What an amazingly positive, proactive thing to do, Becky. Wow. And again, taking us back to that constant theme of uniqueness is flipping great. We just sometimes all need reminding of it. Um, Claire, how can we see neurodiversity as a positive thing? And, and I'm struggling to answer it because at first I had forgotten the question. Um, but when you first said it, I was thinking, it, I, come, I keep coming back to the fact about sharing. And um, it's about making it not difficult for everybody else and showing that, you know, we're, we're just people, really. We just think slightly differently and approach things in probably a slightly more creative way than they did. They do, if that makes sense. Totally. They, they being everybody else. <laughs> yes yeah be us not them and finally Matthew um yeah how have you come to see it as a positive it, you quite realistically said it has pluses and minuses but yeah how is it positive for you I just think um it's sort of for me personally it gives me a, a unique sort of perspective and way of thinking you know, like um, I figured that I can use my experiences in life to sort of uh, help other people as well. Um, you know, it's, it's given that sort of positive influence in my life where like my experiences can actually be used to help change um, things for the better for people. And, uh, and not only that, but uh, it's given me like, I mean, I got like interest in things and I can like really focus on certain things that I enjoy. And um, I can't, I don't know, I kind of feel like I've sort of, for me personally got a deep appreciation of certain things that other people don't really like seem to, to share you know what I mean um like there's, there's certain things I can enjoy and like you know enjoy things that other people do too but like I seem to like when I talk to them about it I can see that I like enjoy it in a different way sometimes and like I think that's sort of what makes me unique and sort of makes like um sort of turns what what I have into a positive so yeah it's um yeah, just like lots of different ways like that. So thank you. Thanks so much. Panel, you have been absolutely amazingly brilliant. Thank you. Great audience questions. Scott, I hope you might be left seeing at least some ways where where um in a sense community in whatever way that means to you uh, getting inspiration from others can lead to a more positive self-appreciation and let's hope society and organizations begin to uh, we can see they are beginning to recognise um, the, the values of our unique brains 
because they're very useful, honestly. Um, lots of interesting stuff happening in chat. Andy giving a, a check to Becky's videos during lockdown. He says he's been an absolute inspiration to his team throughout challenging and frightening times during lockdown. So a huge thank you for that, Becky. I would love to see some of those videos. So perhaps that's something, a link to those can go in a future, a follow up from Difference Northeast. I'm gonna um, crack your picnics open everyone if you haven't already. I'm gonna hand over to Richard because he's basically going to hand back to me. But, yeah. you know, it'll give me 30 seconds to... Yeah, get your performance head on. Um, thank you, Kate, and to the panel. Uh, brilliantly chaired and a really, really good discussion. I'm just going to pull out some highlights while, while Kate's sort of getting ready. Um, so for me, you know, we started off talking about um, neurodiversity being part of the human condition, and that's pretty much what we're about. The difference is, is seeing disability and difference as part of what people are. Um, yes, it can, it's not the norm, but who says the norm is right? Um, I think we've heard that echoed throughout the discussion. Um, it's all about acceptance. Um, and I just think we've heard a lot of positivity about you know, enjoying, we will hear Becky talk about enjoying and accepting my differences and why not, you know, um, celebrate that uniqueness. Um, and yes, there are ups and downs and challenges, um, but that's where often it is society and it's um, neurotypicals like myself who need to, to learn to help to meet people halfway and be more flexible and come up with different options, give people more time, clarify more. These are some of the things that I will try and take away from this um, discussion. Um, I am stuck in my mind, you know, Claire talking about that senior um, civil servant talking about her autism has been amazing in terms of helping her work. You know, it's not always a negative thing. It can be a real strength. Um, um, yeah, flexibility, having different options, learning to be open to difference, and this is a, thing, a big thing for employers, not just because we've always done things one way um, for years and years, doesn't mean to say that's the right way, and that includes jobs, um, you know, can we make jobs fit more to people rather than always trying to fit people into their box? Um, giving people extra time, different ways to process. And that concept of sharing it, again, that's really what, um, what difference is about as well. It's giving people that voice and that safe space to share. And I really thank the panel for, uh, for doing that because I know it's not easy. Um, and I think a really important point that's come through is about uniqueness and not assuming that all autistic or neurodivergent people are are the same they're not you know um everyone is is unique and will experience that differently um, and linked to that as matthew was saying the you know let's remember that the person comes first the person is a unique whole person and it's not just about the diagnosis or the label um, i think that's a really important message that we can end on and we can agree on um so i think that's been fantastic i think it's we've, we've done what we hope to and remember this is autistic pride day and i certainly feel a sense of pride that we've been able to to give um facilitate this discussion and i hope that um people will feel that sense of pride as well um in the, in the group so now it's time yay to talk into my sandwich and um, relax and we'll sit back and we'll hear some of the uh, wonderful uh, words of Kate Fox and um, thank you again to our panel you were uh, brilliant and um, we really really appreciate your time and your input over to you Kate thank you very much Richard 
Thanks, everyone. I'm going to do, I think, three poems. They last about two minutes each. Don't feel bad if you have to go dead on one o'clock. Um, thank you for having been here. If you can stay a few minutes longer, I imagine we'll finish up at five past one. Um, so I'm going to start with, I did this poem for years before I was diagnosed in my set, and it was a bit of a subtle clue um, to my being autistic Um but it was hidden in plain sight. The title of the poem is Lots of Planets Have a North, which is a line that Christopher Eccleston's doctor said to Billy Piper's Rose in the first episode of the first series of the new Doctor Who back in 2005. Lots of planets have a north, normally somewhere I have never been. You need a home to be an alien. Sometimes averages are just mean. I read Jane Eyre when I was seven, moved on to Geoffrey Archer novels by the time I was 11. Never rebelled with drink or drugs, just Salvador Dali posters and ethnic rugs. Lots of planets have a north, normally somewhere I have never been. You need a home to be an alien. Sometimes averages are just mean. I know my voice is distinctive I just think it's cruel the way the word lisp has got an s in it in a similar way to how it's cruel the word dyslexia is difficult to spell I've got two webbed toes my eye lenses are rugby ball shaped when they should be round I score highly on the autistic spectrum which I'm aware sounds like an 80s computer that refuses to network with other computers Lots of planets have a north, normally somewhere I have never been. You need a home to be an alien, sometimes averages are just mean. I'm learning to play the ukulele. My relationship role model is Coronation Street's Roy and Haley. I've never had a one night stand or even a one night snog. I prefer to swallow rather than spit because then it saves wondering what to do with it. Sorry, that's a bit rude for one o'clock on a Friday afternoon, isn't it? Lots of planets have a north. Maybe some of them will hear this verse because every earthling is an alien to some other species somewhere in the universe. Thank you. Uh, my second poem of the three is in um, my very beautifully covered uh, book that came out during lockdown. Um, and I sort of compare autistic people to trees. Basically, I love this new research about how trees in forests communicate with each other under the ground, these invisible networks. And someone comes in the forest and the trees are sending these chemical signals going, someone's in the forest, someone's in the forest. Um, and I love it. So we didn't know that all the time they were connecting with each other and I kind of feel like that's also about neurodivergent people so this is called what could be called communication you might find them staying near the walls or clutching their earphones rocking from foot to foot and looking just above their audience they might be wincing at sirens, saying pardon a lot in crowds, clutching the rails on angled walkways, wondering at the calm faces of everybody else. Sometimes they rest a foot on a crossed ankle in such a way that others will click love in recognition when one of them writes a Facebook post about it. They might have coloured lenses or squint perpetually into the sun. They think everyone can see the fluorescent lights humming. Their eyes dart or fix, so they might be called evasive or invasive. They're stroking a finger, twiddling with their hair, tearing up paper, something with a mesmerising rhythm. They do not always recognise each other, though are often to be found clustered around tierns, outside where it's quiet, in the toilets at parties, in wombs and rooms where everybody shares the same nose because of those contagious genes so they can perpetuate their tangents and straight lines, build forests of themselves, sending micellar releases of carbon and water to those who need them, survival tips, encouragement, warnings, impulses of sound and light. Um, thank you, Nikki, for basically asking me to advertise the book properly. What's your book called, Kate? Where is it available? It's called The Oscillations. It's available from a publisher called Nine Arches Press. Um, and, you know, the exciting new bookshop, The Bound in Whitley Bay. They've got lots of signed copies. Get it there. Go to The Bound. It's lovely. Also other outlets online. I'm going to end with this. It's called The Psychiatrist's Confession. 
I kind of, I love labels. I love diagnostic labels um, of all sorts. But at the same time, I'm aware they are very limiting. As I think we've accurately, eloquently shown labels take us so far, but not all the way. Um, so this takes the mickey out of labels a little bit. It's called the psychiatrist confession. Need to go to Greg's more than once a week. You may be pycotic. Washing your car give you all the joy you seek. You're probably autoerotic. I'm here to give you a label, give you a diagnosis, putting you in a psychological category. That's just my little neurosis. Someone who analyses fires is a pyrobraniac. A person who loves records more than cuddles, a dex maniac. Like Hardy, not Laurel, stanorexic. A hater of quiche, flanorexic. Someone who has difficulty deciding which side of the cheek to present during social greetings. Kislexic, have urges to tread in drying, drying concrete, cementia. Get annoyed if your climbing vines aren't neat, wisteria. Believe you need to get another dog to stop your first one feeling down, you're suffering two pets syndrome. Glad never to leave one particular Cheshire town. That's Stockport syndrome. I'm here to give you a label, give you a diagnosis, putting you in a psychological category. That's just my little neurosis. Belgian accent and a curly black tash. You must be paranoid. Like visiting graveyards and churches and sometimes get the urge to dust pew rails and take church vows as Verger's syndrome. Your heart beats faster when you walk through a field of cows. Bulimia nervosa. Get a buzz from honey, you're a bedophile. Quantum physics and vegetarian cream cheese, more your style, that's quarkalepsy. Frankly, couldn't give a damn. Rhett Butler syndrome. Yes, I'm here to give you a label, give you a diagnosis, putting you in a psychological category. That's just my little neurosis. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, I, I sensed you being a lovely audience, weirdly, even in mostly your, uh, you were there. So thank you very, very much indeed. Thanks to Difference Northeast for, for hosting this, for being so open to making this happen. I think kind of disability and neurodiversity, they intertwine, they connect. Lots of neurodivergent people consider themselves disabled. And I think the more those two appro approaches have to learn from each other in terms of disability advocacy, neurodiversity advocacy, there's something potentially quite amazing can happen. So thanks for being part of that. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you. Um, thanks for your points, are fantastic. Right, thank you everyone. And uh, yeah, be in touch with us if um, you have any follow up questions or, or want any help with anything related. We're more than, more than happy to help. <laughs>